Salma, I think you can start whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you, David. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever in the world you're tuning in from. My name is Salma Yusuf. I'm an advisory board member of World Beyond War, and I'm speaking to you from Sri Lanka. Um, I'm a practicing lawyer here and a human rights and peace building uh, professional. It's a pleasure to see so many uh, people having signed up today, and that is testament to the very interesting and promising event we have lying ahead of us. So as you know, the topic for today is walking a path to a world beyond war. The topic today will essentially be looking at how can walking lay a path for a world beyond war? We have the pleasure of having the executive director and a consultant of the organization, the Abraham Path Initiative, who has been developing walking trails in Southeast Asia, also in the Middle East since 2007. This US-based NGO promotes walking as a tool for economic development, intercultural experiences, and fostering friendships across the challenging divides of our times. When basic needs are met and people are seen in their fullness of their humanity, a foundation for fruitful engagement becomes possible. The webinar will discuss and showcase their work and how when people walk together toward a shared destination, their visions for what may be possible also align. In this webinar, we explore the work, the successes and challenges of creating walking trails in a region known for conflict. We meet today API's executive director and consultant who I will introduce you to you momentarily. The conversation will be moderated by myself and my colleague, David Swanson, who is the executive director of World Beyond War. I will begin by introducing the executive director of the Abraham Path Initiative and our starting speaker for today, Anisa Mehdi. Anisa is the executive director of the Abraham Path Initiative. She is an Emmy award-winning journalist and brings years of storytelling and production expertise to this US-based not-for-profit organization. She is the first American to report the Hajj pilgrimage for television from location in Arabia. Anissa is a graduate of Wellesley College and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Our next speaker for today is Lawin Mohammed, who lives in Iraq, where he leads Abraham Path Initiative Trail Development and Cultural Heritage Preservation Projects. He was a professor of English literature in Syria until he fled during the civil war. Lawin is fluent in Kurdish, English, and Arabic. I will now introduce you to my colleague, David Swanson, the executive director of World Beyond War. David is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He is co-founder and executive director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator for rootsaction.org. David's books include War is a Lie. He blogs at davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. He hosts Talk World Radio. He is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the US Peace Memorial Foundation. Having introduced the conversation, the topic and the theme for today, it is my pleasure to invite my colleague and friend, Executive Director of the Abraham Path Initiative to address you all. Anissa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Selma. It is a real privilege and honor to be on a webinar with World Beyond War with you, Salma, and with you, David, and all of you friends from around the world who committed yourselves likewise to the aspiration that we may actually arrive someday at a world be beyond war, and it won't happen unless we work, work toward it. Uh, Abraham Path Initiative also uh, appreciates the opportunity to share our work and engage in conversation with you 
and this remarkable audience. I'll begin our presentation with background on the initiative, what we do, some of our accomplishments, some of the challenges we've faced, and how we're responding, of course, to the pandemic. And then my colleague, Laween Mohammed will take us to API's current initiative, laying the groundwork for walking trails in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Now I will share my screen. Okay, terrific. So I just wanted you to know for starters, as uh, Selma said, my background is in journalism. I spent most of my career uh, reporting in mainstream television news. And um, I know that images and sound can really impact the way people respond to and react to stories, other people, other places. It's not incidental, it's essential. And also as an American of Iraqi descent, I know what it's like to be part of a misunderstood minority. And for years, as I grew up in New York City, all I saw in the news in terms of reporting on the Middle East was terrorism and conflict. And the Arabs, people who spoke Arabic language really did not have a good image here. And so um, given that I knew there was much more to the story than that, I decided to become part of the system of news reporting and see if I could do anything from the inside to shift how we listened, how we looked and how we reported on stories from the area of the world we call the Middle East. These are some of the documentary films that I uh, pr produced as part of my career. Um, and uh, that career spanned the 1980s through the early 2000s. What was wonderful in, in the, the silver lining, I'll say, of the tragedy of September 11th was that other Americans of Arab descent, other Americans of Muslim persuasion decided and realized it was time to get to participate in the public sphere, in the world of journalism, to be part of the storytelling and not just have other people tell our stories. So although I spent 20 years more or less alone with my particular background in the American newsroom, uh, it has been just wonderful to see an increase in the number of people who share my background and help diversify the way we look at the stories we're telling. So I had less responsibility then to carry this particular uh, if you will allow me, cross on my back. Um, and I heard about the Abraham Path Initiative uh, and it really inspired me. I heard about it in 2007 and that there was an organization looking at walking, physical involvement, having people meet one another rather than me as a reporter interpreting the reality of a situation to you, the viewer it just was brimming with possibilities. And so um, I was very excited when I met William Urey, the uh, founder, and was invited eventually to be on the board. So here are just some wonderful images I love of how people engage in their real experience uh, with the Abraham Path Initiative on their opportunities to walk. This is, uh, uh, a, a, a British woman, Louise, who has uh, made friends with a group of children in the South Jordan city of Beda, which some of you may know as Little Petra. This is where the wealthy ancient Nabataeans lived in a suburb of the big city of Petra that I'm hoping many of you have visited. Um, here we are at having a meal in a home in Northern Jordan in the town of Orjan. And this is the home of Oma Ahmed who we met and asked, would having people come through your town and come into your home perhaps and pay for a meal, would that be good for you to be seen, to be sharing your story, to have your children encounter international travelers? Obviously she said yes, because here we are enjoying a great repast in her home. Um, and uh, these, this is one of the ways that we engage people in the region. I'll tell you though, it was hard at first to get people to take money for their generosity. Uh, they would have given it to us for nothing. And I'll tell you more about that later. Here are a group of Iraqi children in Northern Iraq playing. It's not the kind of scene 
you would see on a bus if you were riding by, uh, driving by. But when you walk through, you encounter wonderful images. This one was taken by uh, API fellow Emily Garthwaite, who is also an ambassador of the Leica camera company and award-winning photographer. And let's see, what other surprise photo do we have here for you? Uh, this was taken in the Eastern Sinai on a journey. We were climbing through incredible mountains and desert. And uh, Noe here um, decided it was time for a selfie. Noe, who was in high school when he walked with us in 2018, will be a participant in API's August 19th webinar, when we're gonna have people who've walked on these trails tell you directly what their stories are. And I hope you'll join us. You can get um, a registration link if you go to our website, www.abrahampath.org. So this is William Urey, the founder of our organization. Uh, William uh, is an anthropologist by training with a degree from Harvard University. One of his specialties was looking at how other peoples resolve conflict, uh, different cultures, different tribes. How do you resolve conflict? And he became an expert in this area and now is quite a renowned mediator and negotiator. With his professor, Roger Fisher, they co-authored this book, Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In, which has become a real go-to for people who are looking at uh, transformative ways of, of negotiation uh, since 1980 when the book originally came out. So he was with a bunch of friends in his hometown of Boulder and they were mulling over the impending American invasion of Iraq in 2003 and thinking, what can we do? You know, Oslo hasn't worked. None of the roadmaps to peace have worked. What can help this region reconnect with itself? And there was the origin story of Abraham, Ibrahim, who uh, uh, the stories will say, uh, walked through the region sharing hospitality and showing kindness to strangers. And he got funding in 2006 from Harvard University to do a test walk, a feasibility study. And about 25 lucky people got to journey both on foot and by bus from one of the places that claims that Abraham was born there, Shanliurfa in Turkey. And they traveled southward through today's Syria, through the Jordan River Valley and ended this particular feasibility walk in the town of Hebron, El Khalil, where it is written in the Bible at least that Abraham and his family are buried. So uh, this year, by the way, we celebrate the 15th anniversary of that walk. We're very proud to be here 15 years later. I'm gonna show you next a map of the region that we work in. So um, when you look at this map, you'll notice that the place we normally call the Middle East is on the Asian peninsula, the Asian continent, not a peninsula, Asian continent by and large. So this is Southwest Asia. Um, you can't find the Middle East on a map geographically because it's a political construct. And um, so I prefer to refer to this region as Southwest Asia. You have the bridge of Turkey to Europe. You have the bridge of Sinai to Africa um, because it doesn't carry all that baggage that the term Middle East carries. Uh, here is that Middle East as you know it with the familiar names of, of countries and the borders drawn in, borders that Mountains don't recognize borders that rivers don't recognize, borders that birds who are migrating over the area do not recognize. But these are the borders within which we must do our work and tell our stories. This third map I'm gonna show you, because I love maps, maybe because it's on my reporter, maybe because it's I'm married to a geologist, but I always like to know where I am. And Siri drives me crazy because she only lets me know how many meters ahead I get to go instead of the world. So this is a map we use to tell the story of Abraham or Ibrahim. Uh, and these cities, Ur, Erbil, Yarbakar, Bakir, uh, Urfa, Aleppo, Damascus, Nablus, Jerusalem, 
uh, crossing Sinai to Memphis, going down to Mecca, these all connect the stories that we've collected about Abraham. We're not the only ones who collected stories about Abraham, but we have collected stories about Abraham from ancient writers, from historians, from the Bible, and from people we've met in all of these places. Um, and it's the story of a family that's walking from Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean, to Memphis, to Mecca. Uh, it's a story of drama and trauma. Did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? It's a story told and retold in three major religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In the Islamic tradition, uh, which is also corroborated, or maybe the Islamic tradition corroborates the stories of the second century rabbis, that Abraham uh, traveled back and forth between Canaan and Mecca when his family split, when Sarah and Isaac remained in, in ancient Canaan and uh, Sarah, uh, Hagar and Ismail came down to Mecca. Um, the story says in the Bible that both sons came together to bury their father after he died. This is a story of generosity, hospitality, kindness to strangers, a tent open on all four sides. And hospitality is the chief um, ethic that we respect and follow at Abraham Path Initiative. And I just, I'm gonna stop my, sh my screen for just a minute because I want to, have I done that? Have I stopped it? No, come on, I can do this. Nope, I can't do it. Have to be able to stop the share, let's see. There we go, here I am. I wanna remind everybody here that this story embraces the possibilities of connection, compassion, communication, conciliation that come from walking side by side, shoulder to shoulder toward a common destination. And the insights, the ideas and inspiration that may grow from that kind of opportunity to communicate are endless. This is a story that reflects the two boys coming together to bury their father and not stories that have followed that try to ascribe an ancient enmity among peoples of that region. We ask, what can people come up with when they walk together, when they're sharing meals, stories, their trust, when they share their vulnerabilities? Abraham Path Initiative is a not-for-profit. We're registered in the United States. We're funded by foundation grants and individual donors from around the world. We are non-denominational. We are not political and we're not a peace building organization per se. What we aspire to do is create places and spaces where peace may be planted by those that visit, the internationals that visit and meet local residents and the local people who are meeting internationals. You know, we've helped generate trails in Turkey, Jordan, Palestine, Sinai, and the Kurdistan region of Iraq. We did trail field feasibility in southwestern Saudi Arabia as well. And what we found is that walking together, sharing meals and stories, when you do that, peace and other good strategies may be planted, fertilized, watered, weeded, and eventually harvested, inshallah, which means may that be God's will in Arabic. So in this way, we walk with you and others on a path that we built together toward a world beyond war. That is our hope and our intention. Now let's go back to this, these beautiful images from our uh, 2020 annual report. So our mission is to build walking trails and use them as tools for intercultural engagement, economic development, and cultural heritage preservation. Our vision is for a Southwest Asia that will become better known for its fabulous, spectacular walking trails and hospitable people than it is for being the Middle East, rife with tension, trouble, and terrorism. Of course, since COVID, we are also building bridges in cyberspace for intercultural connection. And we hope you may attend some of our webinars down the road. You'll find them on our website, again, at www.abrahampath.org. 
So research has shown, our research has shown that practically every town and village in that region, in that map that I showed you, whatever you want to call that region, there is someone named Ibrahim or Abraham in honor of that legendary patriarch. We've heard stories like a man who told us of his grandfather who was a hay farmer and he baled the hay and he, as he wrapped it, he would put four piles and say that's for selling. And the fifth pile was for Father Ibrahim. Another four to sell, another one for Father Ibrahim. Again and again and again. And the boy said to his grandfather, Jindu, I didn't know we had that many Ibrahims in our town. And the grandfather said, my dear, my dear son, my boy, these are for us to sell and these are for us to give in charity to people who need them, as was done by Father Ibrahim, by Father Abraham. To this day in the city of Hebron, there is soup made and given freely to anyone who asks for it, who needs it, and it's called Takiya Ibrahim, Abraham's soup, uh, as a representative of his charity. And they say even today that they're using his original recipe. We've found that everywhere we go, in spite of current events, villagers may just invite you in for a cup of tea, whether or not they're part of a homestay host program. We found that lots of people who are living in marginalized communities, those that the trails connect, are glad to welcome walkers as guests. And sometimes they are reluctant to accept payment for their services. But we've worked it out because this is it turned out to be, we didn't start it this way, but it turned out to be an economic development project as well as being a cultural diplomacy project. We may be a not-for-profit and we as an organization may rely on donations, but charity is unsustainable for communities in the long-term. True development, independence and freedom comes from job training, job creation, self-sufficiency, financial security. So together with our supporters, our funders, and our local partners, we have assisted small towns and marginalized communities, uh, for example, some Bedouin communities in Sinai and in Palestine, to strive toward uh, an improved quality of life with jobs in the tourism sector. A prerequisite to walking a path to peace, in our view, requires at a minimum enough on the table every day and the dignity of employment and an opportunity for your children to walk to school without a threat to their security. So here's a list of some of the accomplishments we've had over the years. Uh, in 14 years, because we were incorporated in 2007, even though the first walk was 2006, uh, we have worked with local partners in all of the different countries I've named, the regions I've named, and have co-created about 1,500 miles of walking trail. Uh, we're working on 2,000 uh, kilometers of new trail in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. I'm trying to be uh, equitable here using miles and kilometers because I know some of you use miles and some use kilometers. Um, in Palestine, uh, with a grant from the World Bank, we invested $3.2 million to create the uh, entirety uh, of trail from the tip to the tail of what is the occupied West Bank, the Palestinian Authority. And we've got uh, uh, trained 51 guides, 21 homestay families, 330 miles, 30 kilometers of walking trail. And uh, when tourism is happening, there's actually a robust economy there. The World Bank statistics have shown an increase in the annual income for people who are participating in Abraham Path Initiative projects along the uh, walking trail in Palestine, which is called now the Palestinian Heritage Trail. You should look it up. Uh, in Sinai, we had we had a we invested fifty thousand dollars from a grant from the Flora Family Foundation over two years and trained twenty guides. The walkers went from eighty in twenty sixteen to four hundred in twenty eighteen. So that's quite an improvement for these uh, Bedouin tribes that have started to work together in Sinai to make the Sinai Trail Association and to have this become a successful project. We had English language training and some other languages uh, training also for our guides. We've noted that language skills for the families improve. Little kids who are 
uh, hanging out with the visitors are hearing English, German, French, Spanish, Japanese, and they're picking it up. And so their language skills are improving. Their computer skills are improving. Uh, they have a wider view of the world and what's possible in it. They, like we, can fluff off our fears by getting to know one another. And our current chair, Josh Weiss, uh, has told this story that in a Palestinian home after a group of Italians had just come and gone, an eight-year-old son said to his dad, you know, dad, I know they don't speak our language and I know they come from a different culture, but boy, they seem a lot like us. You know, you can't pay for that kind of education. And uh, we're very proud that there are independent trail associations now, the Jordan Trail Association, Palestinian Heritage Trail Association, Sinai Trail Association, Association that run and manage and conduct all their business along these trails. Now, since the pandemic, we went from walking to webinars and e-postcards in order to keep connection, bringing people to the path and the path to people through cyberspace, trying to make sure people stay connected with and appreciating the variety of human beings that you get to meet there. So we featured tour guides like Issa Dwaykat, who's in Northern Jordan. Uh, we did a piece on Abraham and the Hajj pilgrimage and uh, my colleague Bruce Feiler appeared on that. He's the author of a book on Abraham. Uh, and uh, we talked together about Abraham's role in Hajj pilgrimage. And I've made uh, several films on uh, the Hajj pilgrimage. So I, I know what he's talking about. We also have uh, gone into our next season of programming with continuing the postcards, uh, continuing our webinar series, which is called Meet Us on the Abraham Path. We featured Carmel Abu Farha, who is a um, Palestinian olive farmer from Wisconsin. His family is from Palestine and he moved back home to work with his dad on the uh, olive farm and they do free trade and it's a marvelous uh, opportunity, Canaan Fair Trade, it's called. We do a live online tour from Bethlehem last year. So at Christmas time, so we got to see the city of Bethlehem at Christmas. It was empty, it was quiet, but people were excited to have visitors from, from six different countries uh, walking virtually in, in real time, not with photographs, in real time through their town and meeting and saying hello to the folks who happened to be there. We have a fellows program and you can look at more of that on our website. So we're very proud of what we were able to create in spite of not being able to work on the ground. And in fact, we can reach more people this way. So uh, we're gonna keep up our cyber programming even when walking uh, recommences and it will. Now, before I introduce you um, to Loween, I just wanna say, that uh, I mentioned a few of the challenges that we have faced. And you know, this work, like any work, it's worthwhile, it's hard, it has challenges. Um, and we faced our share, it's like climbing a mountain. That's why I chose this photograph. That's a mountain we went up in Sinai. Um, and you have to get to the top. You have no choice when you're that place on a mountain, but to continue going. You have to get to the top. It takes stamina, it takes perseverance. It's showing up and showing up and showing up and putting one foot in front of another and having your thighs burn as you go, but you make it and you keep going. So over the years, no matter how many men and boys are named Ibrahim and live in Arabic speaking, Kurdish speaking, Turkish speaking places, some people only associate the name Abraham with Judaism. And then they link Judaism to Israel and then therefore conclude that API is a pro-Israeli organization. Not only that, but some people accuse API uh, of being a normalizing organization that we are actually masking an ulterior motive to positively impact regional relations with Israel. I wanna repeat, we are not a political organization. We are creating a space for people to discover what's possible with regard to their own lives and to lives and living well with others. On the other hand, since we're not currently working in Israel, we receive complaints that API is dismissive of the Jewish narrative of Abraham, which we cannot be. It's the foundational narrative of Abraham. 
Uh, we are an inclusive organization. And so you can see how just with the name, we have faced uh, issues, discussions, uh, challenges for 14 years. And things got particularly tough for API uh, during the previous US administration. The first was because of the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and a lot of American NGOs uh, were looked on askance. You know, we may not, depending on how you voted, the administration still rep represents all Americans. And so that was a difficult time for us. And that was followed a summer ago in the summer of 2020 by the signing of the Abraham Accords, which basically left uh, consideration of the Palestinian condition out of, of an accord between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. And it was called the Abraham Accords. And so people started pointing fingers at us again that this was part of our plan. So, we face these challenges with as much grace and patience as we may. We meet with uh, people in government. We have conversations. We listen carefully, deeply with our hearts wide open and we will keep showing up over and over. It's like that Chumbawamba song. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never gonna keep me down. Well, that's the Abraham Path Initiative. Like these two girls who, uh, live are growing up in the Al Arub refugee camp outside Hebron. They have hope and they have love. And our long-term plan at API is based on hope. Hope is at the root of our one to 200 year plan. Some organizations have a three year plan, a five year plan, we've got those two. But the one to 200 year plan is based on hope. But then who knows? The political situation in Western Asia in the Middle East, we may well have totally transformed. Certainly doesn't look like it did a hundred years ago now, right? Those borders are changing. We don't know what's gonna happen. We do know there will be trails. We do know there will be people who are hospitable and who welcome you in. But who knows by then, maybe it will be possible for a long distance walking trail, uh, connecting people through countries whose borders welcome one another, like. That first, that third map I showed you, there were no borders in that map. Abraham didn't present a passport to get from Mesopotamia to Canaan. Um, so we'll see, we don't know what's gonna happen, but we do know that there are trails. As I said, there are national trails that will serve domestic and international walkers with guides and homestays along the way. And they are getting ready for the end of the pandemic. So you can go there and walk and be guests and visit and experience the authentic hospitality of the region and discover as yet unknown paths to a world beyond war. I want to introduce you now to my colleague, Ali Muhammad, who is uh, joining us from Erbil, the capital city of the autonomous Kurdish region of Iraq, where we're developing new trails. And Lawin, um, yes. please introduce yourself and um, I hope that uh, you enjoy your time with our guests. There's an amazing audience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I don't know if it's my, my camera. Is. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope all of you are doing great and having great time. Uh, my name is Lawin Muhammad, Kurdish from Syria, uh, living in Erbil for uh, 10 years. Uh, I'm graduate, I graduated from uh, English Literature Department in Damascus University, and uh, I finished Diploma in uh, Education and uh, Master in uh, Literature uh, Criticism. Uh, I started with uh, ATI through Leon McCarron when I met him in 2017, we started to talk, and it really inspired me. And then when I started to uh, read about Abraham Path Initiative and their project and their past uh, experience in, uh, in the region, uh, it inspired me that they are bringing people together. They are creating uh, like a connection between uh, nature and the people, like landscapes and the people. Uh, it's not just physically walk or hike, going to the mountain, no. 
it's a kind of walking through the history, uh, storytelling, uh, kind of uh, a connection, creating a connection between the uh, mountains and the uh, people, people from different uh, societies, people from different communities and working together, telling stories, exchanging cultures, exchanging stories. And uh, so it, it inspired me really first. I read a lot about the API initiative and uh, their projects, their activities. And uh, and then I started to think about our area. With Leon, we started to scout, start to scout in the, I said, why in Kurdistan region of Iraq as a Kurdish, I see that we have an amazing landscapes, uh, a rich in the history. Uh, uh, a series of uh, mountains. Uh, and then I, I thought about such like a photos that uh, Anissa is sharing now is like, we have uh, amazing places like Amidi, Amidi Gate, which is like 6,000 years old. Uh, so we started to scout and uh, start to create as a Leon, as a author and a hiking uh, designer, like hiking trail designer. So we could, we, we walked over 1,000 kilometers in the region for the past three years, 1,000 uh, kilometers. And then we could create 175 long hiking trail, 175 kilometers from the area that we just saw it before, from Acre to Choman, to Iranian border. But, you know, as Anissa said before in her map, that walking has no border, so... <laughs> Uh, we just say just to, to clarify for the audience, for the people like, but for when you walk, you never think about the countries, you never think about the borders. Uh, through our hiking trails experience, we, we could create uh, 175 kilometers. We could help like uh, local communities, uh, many villages, like uh, uh, we create a lot of guiders, uh, we have a homestays. We we had one successful guest trip in 2019. Uh, we met families, as you said. We telling their stories uh, through our hiking uh, trails in the region. We have different lengths. Like one day you can hike. 10 kilometers, when day you can hike 20, when you can hike only three kilometers. It depends. This means that we have a really different kind of uh, landscapes. Uh, we could, the, 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 another, the, another point that is really important is the history. It's not only working in the mountains. Uh, we, when we walk, we, we talk and we, 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 we go deep in the history. For example, in Amidi, when we started in Amidi, in just one town, we start in the early morning and we started with a, a Jewish uh, shrine in the spot. Then after one kilometer, we found a, uh, an ancient Christian church. Like after two kilometers, we saw a great mosque of Amidi, which is uh, an ancient mosque for Islam. And then you see a Zoroastrian temple. This means a lot for me and when, I, when we had the guest, I was just explaining to them, this is like a, a great mosaic of the history. Like in the same town, one day you cross by Jewish holy place and then Christian holy place and then Muslim holy mosque. And then you see Zoroastrian 6,000 year old or maybe more 7,000 years temple. So this is what we learned from the hike or from the... Uh, and then uh, next day you can cross the Shanadar cave. Shanadar cave, which is, they found uh, 12 skeleton of Neanderthal, like a uh, beginning of the humanity, like Neanderthal. They found in Shanadar cave, uh, thousand and thousand uh, years old cave. Uh, in Ramandu, this is the photo of Shanadar Cave. Uh, they are still Columbia University, still working there uh, to explore more about it and to do more reports about it. Uh, it's crossed by our line, our 175 uh, hiking trails in Kurdistan. So we cross a great uh, an ancient uh, city of Amidi, and then we have Acre, we have a caves, we have a uh, citadels. 
Uh, so what I mean by it that uh, we walk and then we uh, we learn a lot about history. We exchange. We have, we, for example, in our guest trip, we had a guest from different cultures. So I was, it was really great for me to to hear a lot of stories from them. And then I was more happy to tell them uh, my stories, our stories, and uh, to like exchanging experience, you know, and uh, exchanging cultures, exchanging uh, 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 homestays, for example, in uh, staying in a village with this Kurdish village, having dinner and then staying there, camping or staying in the village. Then in the morning to have a, a Kurdish breakfast and then the, the, the guests or the hikers and the walkers will see the Kurdish culture. They will have a Kurdish food and then music. All of them are the kind of culture heritage, like uh, we show our culture. So it's just about Kurdistan region. So everywhere when people are walking, and hiking, so they know something new. They they learn something about the, the, the area that they are hiking and the area that they are uh, walking in. Uh, sure, in uh, like in everything, we have a challenges. One of the challenges related to the war, we have a landmines fields, which is the reason of the war. So one reason of the war. We have some mountains we really wanted to hike, but we couldn't because there were left landmine fields. So uh, to connect like uh, world beyond war with the uh, API activities, like both of them are same goal, like to enjoy hiking, to enjoy hiking in the peace, far from all the war and its reason or its uh, results. So uh, and uh, I was talking about the the, the homestays, like. Uh, Oh, sorry, the challenges. Uh, one of the challenges were like, uh, one of the challenges were, was uh, the landmines, which many organizations are working on it. So the goal is to clean the area uh, and uh, to, to seek the peace instead of the war and its uh, reason. Uh, and and uh, we stopped because of COVID as uh, all the world had been stopped in 2020, uh, but we continue like uh, online trips. We were like doing some postcards and some test tell storytelling. But the the good point that we could after COVID as well, we did two trips. We visited all our guest houses. We visited all our uh, guiders, local guiders that we uh, actually brought them to this uh, hiking trails uh, field and uh, check their situation after the COVID and we check the situation in different areas, villages, towns, big cities, small cities. Uh, and then we have a plan in, uh, to extend our hiking trails in the future in Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, to cross more cities, to cross more uh, ancient towns because we have a, a lot of historical sites and uh, ancient sites to cover like uh, we crossed Lalash, which is Yezidi, the most holy place in the world for Yezidi people, temple, Lalash temple. It's crossing our uh, uh, trade. We're crossing Zoroastrian temples. We cross uh, Khinis, which is Assyrian. It is King Sanharib uh, palace and uh, Ashur the king. So uh, the god Ashur and the Sanharib the king. We cross... Uh, uh, yeah, Zoroastrians, Christian, the Muslim area. So it's kind of mosaic. It's kind of walking through the history. Uh, so three years of non-stop working on the trails, and uh, I hope uh, we are. We just started. We have a lot. We I hope that, for example, instead of ten guests, we have a hundred guests, and then in next year we have like thousands of guests. It will be a pleasure to see our uh, culture, our uh, listen to our music, having our food, and then to bring some of their culture to our culture. So this is the goal of API activities in Kurdistan of region, to bring more guests, more hikers, more workers to, to see our culture and to learn and to see their cultures. Thank you, Louine. I can't wait to go. I've just yeah. <laughs> that Thank you. Thank you. So if you have any other questions, if I'm, I forgot some points and the time, 
So I will be happy if more explanation in some fields. Yeah, we'll both be glad to answer questions. Nah, thank, thank you. Thank you to Anissa and thank you to Loween. And and people can can ask questions now by raising hand. Usually you go to participants and then find the button to click to raise hand and then I can call on you. Uh, meanwhile, I can uh, refer to Anissa and Loween some of the questions that have come up already in the chat and and that I've thought of. Um, I, I'm actually looking very much forward to being on one of these walks and seeing all of you and shaking hands and embracing in person. Um, someone asked in the chat about hospitality and and cultures uh, and cultural history of hospitality. Is, is hospitality among people in Southwest Asia or in parts of Southwest Asia different in some ways from hospitality in the United States or some part of Europe. What is what is particular about hospitality there? What a fabulous question! Because I have been lucky to travel to many parts of the world, and I find hospitable people everywhere. You know, I, I think it's part of who we are as human beings. And so the question, like, how is it different there than here or the, or somewhere else? And one of the things that I've noted is uh, there's such, it's natural. You walk into a small town and children come rushing up and saying, hello, 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 I love you. Good morning, you know, whatever English words some may know. And in our town, I live in a very lovely town in New Jersey, but I, as an adult, will see children, I'll say good morning, and some of them will scatter like I just frightened them and some will shyly say good morning back. But it is a rare child here in my community, it may be different in yours, but in my community where children will come up and say hello. And so it's part of the nature, a natural way of being that is not suppressed. And I have found that consistently. I don't know what you have to say about that, Loween, but I have found that consistently yeah. from the Mediterranean to Mesopotamia. Yeah, like uh, talking about, sorry, talking about the hospitality in the uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq is really famous of their hospitality, their special hospitality. One small example that one day with the guests, with, when we were scouting, we had the three lunches because they were swearing that you, you have to, to have a lunch with us. So we had it. And then another family in the next village, they said that you have, a, you, you have to have a lunch with us as well. That's more than a dozen 20 cup of teas and uh, uh, it's a spontaneous way of uh, hospitality in the region that they love strangers, they love people to come and see their uh, areas. Very good uh, answers. Uh, if, if anyone, I don't, I'm not seeing any raised hands is why I'm not calling on anyone to speak up. So don't be shy. And if, uh, if there's some technological glitch to raising your hand, uh, let us know through the chat. Um, but uh, another question uh, that's come up in the chat, people are concerned if they're far in the world from Southwest Asia or the Middle East and they want to get there, what about all the fossil fuel that has to be burned? How can they get there responsibly or how can they justify uh, the fossil fuels that are typically burned, the environmental destruction that is typically done in order to get to a different region of the planet and engage in a productive, environmentally sensitive, and, and culturally diplomatic uh, peacemaking initiative? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. I think it's one that every single one of us should be contemplating regularly um, because we've spent the last 18 months, most of us, not doing that, not flying places, right? And um, there's no really simple answer. You know as well as I do that there is no solution. We don't have that great Star Trek option to transport from one place to another, have dematerialized and rematerialized there yet. I don't even think that's in our 200, you never know. Um, so you have to decide whether you're going to uh, fly there or are you going to, as I know one of our participants today on this call, Moni, has done, walk there from some place in Europe. Spend three, four, five months and walk. 
And once you're there, then you keep on walking. So that's a, uh, it's like a real kind of pilgrimage opportunity. Uh, if you can do that, walking is an, uh, an option. Um, certainly once people have arrived, uh, right, we, we spend most of our time on foot and not in cars, but occasionally uh, you, you'll get a, a lift, uh, not a LYFT, but a, a ride to um, a, the starting point of the trail. So it's complicated. And I appreciate the complexity of the question. It's complicated how to be 100% uh, respectful of our environment and sustainable and um, not use fossil fuels in any international project or even local projects. Anyone else have a good idea how to do that? I'd love to hear those. <laughs> Someone in the chat has suggested purchasing carbon offsets. I guess we will all have to look into that. That's uh, what that means. There are a couple, there are two or three people who raised their hands and now have taken them down again. So I'm not gonna call on them. I, I, if I don't call on you instantly, just keep your hand up because somebody's answering a previous question. Um, uh, some other questions that, uh, well, a question that just came up in the chat, and I'm not 100% sure what it means, but maybe you are, uh, Lawin or Anissa, how would it look for a medical group to ask about health history and growth? How would it be looked at for a medical, I don't know if this means for a medical group to take part in a walk and ask people they meet about their health history? I interpret away. I, I... Lawin, do you want to? Try that. Uh, I didn't get it well about the how the medical group for like a, in a history or if I get the question right or. Well, I'll say that on one of our walks, like to Sinai, we had people do a self-assessment of their stamina, of their own ability to walk. You know, you saw that photograph of that one particular uh, hill we uh, mountain we went up. You know, are you capable? Can you do this kind of walking? Um, but we didn't, uh, and we relied on people's uh, own word about their condition. But uh, if there's more to that question, we're happy to answer it. David, I did see Becca had her hand up and Arthur had his hand up. Uh, uh, had is in past tense? No, no, they're waving. They're waving their hands like this. Their actual physical hands. Uh -huh. right. uh, what's, the, what's the name of a person who's waving Becca, their hands? Becca and... Arthur, two separate individuals. Becca, uh, go ahead and unmute. Yes, I would love to hear uh, personal stories that have really touched you both, and Lawin especially because you uh, you come from uh, traditions that I know so little about, and I'm very curious about. I would love to know of on your walks uh, an experience that really touched you. Okay, so one of the stories that really, I actually two stories, one of them, a story of one family, they, their village had been destroyed through the war in uh, Anfang campaign, they completely lost the village, but every year they came back and they camp in the place of their village to stay for three months of the summer, to stay in the tents and living a really nice life just to stay in, their, in the place of their village. And then in the winter, they come back to the, their new town. But we heard a lot of their stories, how, how really hard to lose your complete village. Your village became completely destroyed. But they insist to go every year, three months, to, to grow with their herb, to go there and live for three months. In this, the, the, the village called as Omarawa. So they go every year there to live three years of the three months in a year. And then in the winter, they come back to their new places. But the story is how they connected to the land, not only to their home. Like uh, they came back to their village to stay there and then come back in the winter. Every year, they came back to the place of their village. So this story, we heard a lot of, about them, but this, uh, this story can, uh, touched really me. The second story is the story of one of our guiders called Ahmad Rezani. He's from Choma. He's an old Peshmerga. We, through our walking, he remembered how he was fighting in the mountains 20 years ago. So every single spot, he said, I stayed here for 10 nights uh, during the war, like 20 years ago. 
Then in the next cave, he said, I stayed with my wife 10 nights here in this. Actually, he spent his honeymoon in the mountains in the same. Uh, so by chance, when we hiking, when we were hiking in the trail, uh, he mentioned, he just remi- uh, remembered that this trail, he walked 20 years ago when he was fighting as a Peshmerga. Peshmerga is the, the uh, Kurdistan forces, like a uh, uh, Kurdistan army. So he remembered all his stories. He was guiding us, but then suddenly he saw, oh, I walked this 20 years ago. I stayed in this cave. I stayed without food for two nights here. Uh, so really, he had a lot of stories, but the story is still with me that how we walked after 20 years, he, remind, he remembered all his stories as a fighter or as a Peshmerga in the same trail. And this trail is a part of our trail. This, uh, it's one day of our trail from uh, Dargala to Choman. Yeah, these two stories are really still with me during our uh, we will hear we hear a lot of stories, but these two stories still with me, like uh, they touch my heart. So we thank you, uh, Loween. We now have a lot of great questions in the chat and a lot of people raising their hands. So I'll try to go back and forth. Uh, people in the chat are suggesting that we shouldn't uh, be as concerned about using a little fossil fuel to do good when so much is being used to do bad. Uh, and people are recommending sailboats and ships and trains um, and uh, wow, lots of lots of questions. Um, uh, some related, in particular, to how to prepare for one of these walks. Uh, what does it cost? Are you with someone who speaks English? Should you bring gifts uh, to give to people you you visit? Um, anyone want to speak to some of those? Uh, I think regarding the or, uh, organizing this trip is returned to Anisa and API as an organization, as an association. They are planning for the trips and uh, how to open the registration for the next trip of the guests. Uh, regarding the second part of the, I can answer the second part and Anissa can answer the first if it's uh, okay. Regarding the English, yes, we have uh, uh, people who can speak English, they can translate and uh, some guiders, they can speak, some of them, even the guiders, can, they can speak and even the local guider cannot, we can have a translator with us. Uh, regarding the gifts, uh, some it's related to the hospitality. Some people cannot accept it, but, but most of the people can accept, like you give them gifts. We sometimes people were working for us as a guide that we suffer to give them money that you guided us, you should give you something. If he, he feel like, no, I shouldn't accept it. It's my duty to, to guide you. Uh, so it depends on the people, on the family, on the, 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 the village that we grow up. Some accept and some doesn't, some don't accept. Okay, great. Manisa, did you want to speak to that or should I call on the next person? Um, I, I don't really have too much to add. I usually bring pencils with nice erasers and, and paper to give to little kids. Um, I find that they they can use those. Okay, and you can I'm done. check in our website for opportunities to walk with API, but you don't only have to walk with API. You can hire a guide on your own. We have guides listed on our website and there are other organizations, other tour operators who will lead you and we always recommend using a guide because uh, uh, you'll learn more, you'll feel more at home and you're also then contributing to the economic development and stability of the region. I'm going to ask Arthur if he can uh, unmute. I'm told that you were raising your actual hand, Arthur. Uh Thank you. I'm not too good with Zoom and computers, but I just wanted to share. um, I have walked from the beginning of 92 on the six continents, close to 50,000 kilometers with groups and alone. And uh, I'm a peace activist human rights activist, pacifist, conscientious objector. And uh, I have walked 
all the so-called holy places, sacred places in uh, Palestine, Israel. Um, yeah, there are many experiences. Um, I'm at the moment in Concord, Massachusetts from 2018. And uh, I wasn't planning to be more than a month or two here. Um, we I'm had Dave a Brubeck, union. Didn't you, while you were there. I can uh, hear Dave Brubeck playing in the background. I'm sorry, I'm in a cafe. And I don't know, <laughs> it's not possible to eliminate it. Um, Arthur, did you have a question for Loween or me? Or oh, uh, I wanted to share for the question about um, how to organize walks. Um, we walk across America in 92 for the indigenous people to counter Columbus and to stop nuclear testing in Nevada. A Belgian group had organized it with American activists in Columbus, Ohio, and they had worked several years because it's a long way. Um, so they're local coordinators and all that. And then we walk across Europe for nuclear free world in 90. Five, but I want to suggest also um, the Japanese Buddhist order, Nippon Zan Myokoji, that have built peace pagodas in many countries. We walk with them 98, 99 from um, the peace pagoda here in New, Ang uh, New England. It's so Arthur, you are, you are an activist. You are an activist. And um, are we... I would not discourage activists from walking on any of the trails that we have uh, co-created with our local partners, but um, the, we don't, we would not be um, in our own not-for-profit integrity if we were to organize an activist's walk. So we would encourage you to work with David and World Beyond War to and we could partner to a certain degree, point in the right direction for the for the tour guides and the tour operators that might be able to facilitate uh, a walk of activists. Um, I think sometimes people walk and become activists as they do. Um, but uh, I, I that's, hope. that's what my answer for now would be. Um, there have been some questions in the in the chat about uh, the fact that there are wars in some of this part of the world. Um, there are also sanctions imposed by various governments on other governments in this part of the world. Um, what uh, what concerns have there been? Are steps taken in terms of safety for those doing these walks? Uh, do you go through war zones? Do you go through countries that sanctions are imposed on? Uh, and uh, possible upside <laughs> to this question. You started out with the problem of how the media reports on things from afar. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, is how it reports on wars and the victims of wars. Can these walks help in that regard in any way? Right. Great question. I'll start with the last part because that's first in my mind. We have uh, definitely uh, arranged walks that will pay visits at refugee camps. So in a sense, um, you're spending time with victims of war and uh, get a chance to sit and either play with the kids or listen to the moms and dads, obviously with translators. So we have had those opportunities to engage directly with victims of war. And as Lawin pointed out, you know, some of the people in his part of the world, in the Kurdistan region, have had to move themselves from one part of Kurdistan to another to get out of the way of war. And so even though they're not direct victims of a current war, they're, you know, they still have stories of the past. But we do not walk in areas where there is war going on. We, uh, that's Excellent. not the idea here. That's not the idea. Uh, I recall walking in Jordan in 2015 when ISIS was on the rise and actually actively recruiting in uh, Iraq and, and even in 
Jordan and um, having grown up in New York City, um, it, it, you know, it, it, there's either danger all around all the time or you just are smart about things and you don't put yourself in the path where danger might be likely. I felt safe in Jordan uh, because ISIS seemed farther away when in Iraq than it did from me reading the newspaper articles in New York City. And I was also very pleased to see the young people who were volunteering, young uh, Bedouin in this case, who were volunteering to help uh, on our way. When Ali, young Ali brought along his donkey Coco who carried stuff for us and carried us when we got too tired to walk ourselves. And here was a young man who had an opportunity for a future in the tourism sector and was not going to be susceptible to an ISIS recruiter because he had a future of his own to face. So we don't walk in, in dangerous area, areas. As Louine said, we know where the minefields are and we avoid them astu uh, assiduously, if that's the right word, we avoid them. Uh, and the only in, uh, injuries that I'm aware of, having walked uh, on uh, for walkers on the Abram path can result from one, dehydration. And two, we had a colleague who, um, tripped and twisted his ankle and had to be airlifted out. And that was a great story of, of uh, people from uh, disparate functions coming together to, to assist a person in need. But we're not gonna take you. Louine, did you wanna so speak? Yes, let me just add something about the safety. Uh, it's true that our area suffered a lot of the war and conflicts long time ago, like nonstop wars. But the most important thing, the first thing that we do is the safety, security and the safety. The, the trail is completely fine. Uh, we know the mines are in some mountains, we skip them and it's not, they are not included in our, uh, our trail at all. Uh, we face many, we, we heard a lot of stories of the victim of the war, like uh, people who lost their families because of the bombs and the, Wars, people who flee to another country and come back after 10 years became refugees in another country because of the war. Uh, we face people who lost some part of their body, really sad stories. Somebody lost their legs, their hands in the mines. Uh, yeah, we heard a lot of story about the victims of the war, but the walking is completely safe. And we scout, we scout 1,000 kilometers, and then we have 175 kilometer ready for hike so we walked uh, sorry we lost i lost the power so we we we, uh, we ensure the security in uh, in the area that we hike and uh, it's completely safe and uh, the security is there great i'm gonna call on glenn to unmute and apologize to raju who i think gave up on me calling on him and uh respond to moni that i will indeed call on you as soon as possible glenn would you like to unmute i, I think i did have i yes you have Okay, um, I, I apologize for being so vague. I'm the one that asked about the medical group. Uh, by training, I'm a doctor of sociology. So taking you know, a trip or a, a, a walk with these groups, my main interest would be looking at, okay, how do they handle their community health structure and community health support in these small rural areas? I mean, uh, currently the pandemic has shown that we have to design better health systems for especially rural and uh, indigenous groups that don't have the resources that the larger countries have. So that would be one of my main interests in looking, I mean, not to go in and tell them how to do medicine, but how it's handled and how we may be able to help and support some of the systems that they already have. Okay, so Glenn, that's a bit of a, uh, of a research trip you're looking at. That would be an interesting thing to, uh, to conduct, um, to figure out how to do that. I don't see why that couldn't be done as long as expectations were set ahead of time with the people that you were going to meet. We could introduce you to uh, you know, clinics and doctors and that, that could happen. Um, don't you think, Louine? 
a, a, a yeah. research script for, for um, on the medical field? Yeah, that can can be that can happen. Like a, uh, it can happen in the in the trade, like uh, uh, medical groups with us. Meaning the hiking, if uh, it means, yeah, why not? And that's just, uh, the more deep you go in the simple areas, you find the less medical cares. They depend on their uh, health, food, healthy food, healthy. So they not. Uh, going deeper in the improved and uh, high technology health uh, groups, uh, but it can be in the trade. Yeah, yeah, Glenn, why don't you email me, Anisa A N I S A at abrahampath.org, and we can continue this conversation. Any of you, uh, if you have additional questions, are welcome to email me at Anisa at abrahampath.org. That would be an interesting pursuit, Glenn. Okay, I'm going to jump to another person who wants to ask a question. Moni, uh, I hope you're, I'm saying your name remotely correctly. Um, can you? Moni's the person who walked those thousand miles to get <laughs> to the Middle East. Hi, Anissa, and Hi. hello, Lawin, and everyone. Hello. It's, uh, thank you so much for your incredibly informative and I know heartfelt um, work that you're doing in the area. Um, one of the things that really calls to me is, you know, this path is called the Abraham path. Um, and Abraham wasn't just any ordinary man. You know, he was in addition to being someone who was known for his hospitality, for his generosity. He was a man of faith and he was a man who had his faith tested over and over again. And so one of the questions that I have for you is how has this experience of developing the path and even walking the path affected you personally in terms of your faith? Like what has it done to test it? What has it done to, I don't know, um, deepen you into it or other, other things that may have touched upon your faith in working with this, with this initiative? Lowen, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure, sure. I have been. It's very personal. I appreciate. Really, it. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good question, and uh, yeah, I have been my personally had been changed a lot before and after these two years of hiking. Through the hiking, uh, and uh, especially as I mentioned before, that we pass a lot of faiths, a lot of group, group religions, and there are every group that we meet. They have their really pure face about their ideas. For example, you go deeper inside the mosque of the Muslim, you pray with them, you, you feel like, uh, then you so do the holy shrine of the Zoroastrians, you feel how pure they are from inside. Then you go to the Yezidi faith temple, how they do their faith, how to do their uh, religions, uh, uh, daily, like, uh, uh, and then you go to Christian church. You see how they, you feel like we, 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 you know, through the trails we visited all of them. We prayed with the Christians. We prayed with the we saw uh, Jewish holy places, Yazidi Christian. So it's giving you some you you change a lot from inside your faith, like uh, going high, high. You related to the holy places. Each holy place you visit and you stay in, you feel yourself like you, they touch your heart. These places touch your heart. Like, uh, uh, you know, I cannot say in each single one, but in general, the faith uh, affect a lot of my character and my personality. Anissa, did you want to speak to that too? Or? I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. It's... Um... I think one of the reasons I became a reporter was so I could ask those questions and not answer them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say that um, in many of my experiences as a reporter and as executive director and as a, previously as a board member of this organization, the lesson I keep learning is I need to get out of my own way and trust. Like Abraham had to trust. And like so many religious leaders who are under duress and in very challenging circumstances, not just religious leaders, but people all over the planet under very challenging circumstances. Um, I sometimes think I have to solve it myself. 
and I have to muscle my way through and it's going to be my body and my brain. And, and that's a very arrogant point of view, actually. And when I can recall, and in conversations like this right now, thanks to your prompting, Moni, I, I can be reminded that it's not all up to me and that I can allow for my own vulnerability and my own trust in all y'all, but also in, in everything else that is unseeable and un unknowable that um, it's gonna work out. As a follow-up, are atheists like myself allowed to take part? <laughs> this is a non-religious um, book. This is not religious that everybody's wrong. Good. Um, I'm going to, uh, Raju wanted to ask a question. I'm going to ask him to unmute now. So I'm going to try to. <laughs> Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, it seems that this is the, the initiative is amazing. I've heard others talk about it, um, the Abraham Initiative. There are a lot of people who may not be able to walk because uh, they will be, they're elderly or they have uh, physical illnesses. So I'm wondering if it's possible. Uh, the virtual reality is being used now as a tool uh, to bring in the experience and allow the person to have the collective experience with everybody so they can be a part of it. Mm. And it can bring in more people in from different places around the world. It can actually uh, uh, bring that experience into a, per into a person who might never have had a chance to see what that could be like. Um, so these are the type of things I'm wondering. Um, if there, uh, I'd like to see if anybody would like to, to contact me uh, for any tips or discussion on this, I'd be happy to. My project in India and Pakistan has some kind of an overlay. Um, there was a initiative about six months ago where they did a walk through Kashmir mm. to look at the beauty of Kashmir, but at the same time to look at the potential uh, to see how people can can ask questions and look at the history and get a sense of how everyone was coming from this one place. And the separation's only been happening over the last 75 years, 100 years. It's very recent. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm a baby boomer. Our generation is still leaving its mark on the generations. We still have a place in history, we still have a place that we want to uh, make a, a, a leave a mark. So I'm wondering how the baby boomers, how us 60-year-olds could participate and help, and at the same time, how we could kind of be a, a, a bridge. Mm -hmm. That's great, Raju. Uh, will you share your email address with us uh, so that we can be in yes. touch? Um, the question about uh, being available to people who cannot travel is one that we've thought about and been thinking about for a long time. Uh, virtual realities are a wonderful option, but we don't have yet ourselves the funding for uh, the technology to create the three-dimensional uh, um, opportunity through, you know, you have to actually have those cameras, the 360 cameras and walk it and then be able to add the interpretation, the narration, the, the tour guiding along with. So it's, it's on, a, on a wish list, but a little further down than the, um, it's closer than the 100 year plan, but it's a little further than getting our trail in Kurdistan finished, for example, in the Iraqi uh, Kurdistan region. Um, but that's where we are really appreciating the cyber world. And when I tried to describe the live online tour we, we offered, it was more like what you're talking about. It would give everybody a chance to be present in real time in another place, but sitting at their computer screen. And that's what we did in Bethlehem on, on December 18th and 19th of 2020. Uh, there were no photographs. There was no narration over a photograph. It was a guide standing there with a camera person uh, filming him and we were all on Zoom. 
and he welcomed us. And he walked through this street where, where he had not led a tour in nine months and told us about, you know, these doors would have been open if, if it were regular times, but they're all closed. And this was the shop of somebody and here was the shop of that. And so we got an inside look and then somebody came by carrying a tray of coffee and he said, oh, Sammy, how are you? This guy makes the best coffee in Bethlehem. And they had a chat right then, right there with us. A priest came out of the church of the nativity. We had a chat with him right then, right there. So there are those opportunities. They're a little less sophisticated, Raju, right now than uh, virtual realities, but they are what we're trying to create as live online experiences for people to travel now, um, especially when travel is inaccessible to those who can travel, but also for those who can't. So we're planning a live online tour in Jerusalem in October, in Erbil, possibly in October. Uh, we want to do a live online tour of Mecca. We want to do a live online tour eventually in Damascus. We would love to do a live online tour in the south, south central parts of Turkey, you know, so that we can bring people access to these cities, even though we are not physically there. Loween, I don't know if you wanted to speak to this too, but there's a similar question from Diane. Uh, we're running uh, pretty low on minutes at this point, but uh, Diane asked if people who can't walk long distances can ride donkeys or walk part of the way and then get a ride, etc. Yes. Uh, they, yeah, and in the Kurdistan region, they can uh, host those donkeys, but I think walking is the best because uh, really nice. We have a different stages of the... Um, uh, length and uh, difficulty and physicality, so maybe, but we never had tried to, to have a like a ride and then continue walking. All the trails is just by walk and because it's really better for me, walking is the best to see more and to focus more on the path on the, on the road, but if the guests or the hikers want, they can they can hire a horses, donkeys to cross one part and then go to the next part. They can uh, walk in one part and then continue walking in the uh, uh, next part. It's actually, that's absolutely right. And we can, you know, we will, we will survey people who want to walk ahead of time if they're walking with an Abraham Path Initiative walk. And we'll assess, you know, if somebody, like, I'm, I'm uh, the tail end of the baby boomer, boomers. Um, and I found like in, in Jordan, as I said, I, I sometimes rode on Coco, Ali's donkey, because I was exhausted. Um, and we try to have our walks be walks, not hikes. And sometimes we are hiking because that's the only way to get from A to B, but if you can't, and that has happened, um, uh, depending where you are, a car can meet you. You know, we may have to walk half a mile to a road but a car can meet you and bring you to the next place. And we like to be aware of those kinds of uh, situations as far as possible so we can be responsive. I, I, I'd love to ask one more uh, war related question coming from World Beyond War, just because I, I'm struck by what great work this is and how little it costs to advance it. And I'm aware that the US government alone is putting a trillion dollars a year, give or take, uh, into wars and militarism and the rest of the world, another trillion or so every year. Uh, and it seems 5% of just the US military spending, $50 billion a year, if you were to imagine that invested in tourism in Southwest Asia, well, could you develop you know, an answer, uh, what it would look like to advance, to, to put even a tiny fraction uh, you know, $20 trillion just from the U.S. over the past 20 years, what would 5 or 10% of that put into this kind of project look like? How would the region be look different now than how it in fact looks? Louis? Yes, that's really, if just by thinking of it, it will change you. You know, you, you think about it, what if we found more such projects? What if we bring people together more than making them part from each other, far from each other? What if we do some project to, 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 to make a peace, people connected to the peace, talking about the peace, then uh, make them far from each other and hate each other by the war. So it's really make a difference. And when 
when you pay some for the building is much better than pay a lot for destroying this small it means a lot and make more difference when you pay like million for the war maybe 2000 of them if you pay for the peace it will make more difference and more difference and they will can cover the million of the war so to like thousand of the peace and the walking and the connecting to the nature and landscape can cover a million of the war what a great idea to have just I, I don't know if we could even deal with 5%, $50 billion. I don't know what we would yeah. <laughs> possibly do, but uh, I know that um, we would have more than two people on our staff, for example. And um, we would want to do the virtual reality and make yeah. um, VR helmets available to people somehow or another. If we could send them to people who needed them, if we had that much money, we could give them. Yeah. Away. But, uh, we would certainly not want to build big fancy guest houses and uh, have them have home cooked meals catered. We really want to maintain that authenticity of hospitality. Um, but we might be able to use electric cars locally rather than vans, minivans and buses uh, so that we'd be not contributing to the carbon footprint. I would love to be able to fund uh, congressional or parliamentary junkets, groups of people who are in the political sphere yeah. to come and have an experience of the places that they have previously said, yes, bomb them. Yeah. You know, so that some, they meet people. Some, two or more points, like we can, for example, clean two mounds from the mines. We can uh, train hundreds of local guiders. We can uh, take local people to, to the trips that they see their their area, to be proud of their area, so they can protect their environment more when they know more about their, uh, how amazing, how good their nature and their land landscapes and how, so they will, be, they will be proud to be part of this world, so they will even uh, protect their environment more. So clean mountains from the mines and uh, protect the environment with uh, like a 10 or 5% of the money that's been paid for the wars that make more difference. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Anissa and Louine and Salma. Do any of you have any final comments, any thoughts that have come to mind during this session or, or want to tell people again how to get involved? What's the next uh, walk uh, or project that they can get involved with? Well, we have, uh, a, we have a webinar coming up uh, on August 19th at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, New York time, uh, wherein people who've walked are gonna share their own stories and their own photos. And you're welcome to, to register for that. All our webinars are free. And um, it's again at our website, www.abrahampath.org. Um, we are hoping to be able to offer uh, real on the ground walking opportunities, uh, one, like lots of fingers and toes crossed um, in the Kurdish region of Northern Iraq in the, in the second half of October. And then in, in the springtime, we would like to be offering walks again in, uh, in Palestine, in um, Jordan and in Iraq again. And we may have courses, walking courses. I noted uh, there's uh, one of our listeners here is in the mediation and we are going to have a we planned, but was canceled last year, a walking course in negotiation. So that, you know, keep your eyes on our, web, on our website and you can find out when and if these courses are gonna take place. But a walking course in negotiation is a very exciting opportunity ahead. Perfect, terrific. Um, we, we will also send out a follow-up email to everyone uh, who showed up uh, or even just registered for this webinar, uh, and we'll include a link to that upcoming webinar and any other information from Anissa and Louine and uh, anything that any of you send me uh, by email that should be included in that. Um, so, uh, did it, Louine or, or Salma, did you want to say anything else before we go? Yeah, the last thank you. Thank you for, uh, I just want to thank uh, World Beyond the War and everybody who was with us participate in this webinar. I hope in the future we can uh, focus more on, uh, on uh, hiking, 
uh, what I mean by hacking and only physically just uh, connecting cultures and uh, to see more projects and uh, continue, especially in Kurdistan region of Iraq, we just started, you know, it's just the beginning. You have a lot and a lot, a lot of more trails to connect them together, to make them one line uh, and extended more historical places to be included and more guests to see our culture. This is what I hope for the future. Terrific. Very good. Well, thank you uh, to our speakers and, and thank you to everyone who took part in the terrific questions. Uh, and there will be a video shortly at uh, worldbeyondwar.org slash webinars. Peace. Thank you, David. And thank you, Salma, for connecting us. Thank you. Thank you, Salma. For, yeah, thank you so much.